Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon and good evening. Um, I'm sure we have audience members from all over the world. I'm Jessica Deer, the Director of Ranking Digital Rights, and I want to thank you so much for joining us today for our panel, Our Telco is Getting a Pass on Digital Rights. I'll give a brief introduction and then turn our program over to my colleague and RDR Scorecards Program Manager, Vesna Vesenauer, who will moderate a discussion with our panelists on the importance of paying more attention to telecom companies in our digital and information ecosystems. RDR is an independent tech policy research program based at the think tank New America in Washington, DC. Next slide, please. We evaluate the world's most powerful tech and telecom companies according to their public commitments to respect and promote human rights to free expression and privacy. And there are three main principles that drive our work. Transparency is central to accountability, even if not the end goal. It's a baseline that we have to establish so that we can follow progress um, or note declines. Therefore, um, in our methodology, we evaluate publicly disclosed policies of the companies that we assess. Um, it's sort of an open source intelligence approach, um, primarily because the companies don't tell us enough. Um, we can't get into their black boxes, et cetera. So we look at publicly disclosed policies. And we focus on free expression and privacy because they enable a broad range of rights. Next slide, please. We publish the results of our evaluations in two rankings, the RDR Big Tech Scorecard and the RDR Telco Giant Scorecard. These two publications comprise the RDR Corporate Accountability Index. And this is our first time, uh, this year represents the first time that we've published each of these scorecards separately. Previously, we had published the RDR Corporate Accountability Index uh, all at once, but thought that splitting the scorecard gave us a good opportunity to dive deep into some of the specific issues related to both digital platforms in our big tech scorecard and telecommunications companies in our telco giant scorecard. Next slide, please. Our aim, our theory of change is that we wanna push companies to compete on digital rights by showing what their policy commitments are, what they say they do, um, and to uh, that this will help them improve their, their policies and their disclosures and align them more with human rights. And then that will in turn uh, create a global internet that sustains and supports human rights. Um, we also think about uh, our standards, the standards that we evaluate companies against as a checklist for how companies can compete in a race to the top rather than sort of seeking out the lowest common denominator. And um, this checklist helps them sort of design their policies in a way that, that they can have some sort of uh, sense that they are actually doing things that will support human rights. Next slide, please. We organized this panel to introduce RDR's inaugural Telco Giant Scorecard, which is our ranking of the policy transparency of 12 global telecommunications companies that operate on five continents around the world. Um, and this is the first time that we've done this telco giant uh, scorecard and, and done this deep dive into the threats that telecom companies pose to our human rights. And we chose to do this because we really think that telcos deserve more scrutiny and public pressure. Uh, since 2015, when we first started the Corporate Accountability Index, our research has shown that telcos are less transparent than big tech while actually having the potential to do more harm. And the reason why we say they have the potential to do more harm is that they're generally people's first point of access to the internet. In addition, they have far more accurate and granular data from their billing, uh, from billing, uh, demographic data, location data, and behavioral data, and therefore they can pose a wider array of risks, just as a result of both how essential their services are and also the data that they need to collect in order to provide those services. So key to understanding, another aspect that's key to understanding their power is recognizing that they operate at the behest of governance, uh, governments uh, on government contracts. And when those governments are authoritarian or authoritarian leaning, they can compel telcos to take actions that violate human rights, um, like shutting down networks or uh, installing surveillance equipment. And telcos really have very little recourse except um, as we expect them to do, to publicly disclose that they are being asked to do these sorts of things. In addition, telcos are increasingly forming partnerships with big tech 
that can threaten human rights, particularly through targeted advertising um, and zero rating programs. Next slide, please. So today we're talking about um, our telco giants ranking uh, that was just released on Monday. And over the last six months to produce this ranking, we've engaged a network of researchers all over the world to follow our rigorous methodology to evaluate these 12 companies on five continents in 10 different legal jurisdictions on more than 250 aspects of their policies in three areas, corporate human rights governance, freedom of expression and information, and privacy. And you can get a glimpse here of the results of our ranking um, with Telefonica taking the top spot, the Spanish-based telecom company, and um, see progressively down, down the line sort of where different telcos fall. Uh, next slide, please. And our rankings uh, in our scorecard comprises two main parts. Um, our company report cards, uh, which sort of after our data collection process, which includes sharing preliminary, preliminary findings with companies themselves for their input, results are assessed and distilled into these two main products. Our company report cards, and the next slide, please, uh, and our key findings. The company report cards include highlights and key takeaways, as well as sort of showing um, how companies have progressed over time. Um, and our key findings uh, really try to take a, a bird's eye view of the data that we've collected and to process it to identify what are the key trends that we're seeing, what observations or what are the, the particular pain points or areas where um, companies have improved or need to improve the most. And on the next few slides, I'll share some of those findings with you, each of which uh, you can learn more about in the nine essays on our on our uh, Telco Giants Scorecard website. Um, these findings have been sort of written by our team and uh, and go deeply into not only our data but also the context of each of these human rights uh, sort of risks. Next slide, please. So the main uh, one of the main findings is that there's been some progress, but mostly stagnation. Um, all of the telcos that we're evaluating today were also evaluated in the last, uh, in the 2020 RDR index. And I think notably, uh, MTN and America Mobile, MTN is a South Africa based teleco and America Mobile is a Latin, uh, a Mexico based, uh, telco that operates around Latin America and also some in Europe. Um, their improvements were driven, uh, by, they are the ones that improve the most year over year since the last index. And those improvements were driven by, um, in, in part by both companies published the first transparency port reports in their history, and also are the first companies to do so on either continent. Um, so transparency reports are addressing how companies handle demands such as content or account blocking. Um, and also what their disclosures are on internet shutdowns. Uh, another um, highlight or sort of observation, top high level observation from this year's data is that telcos are overall less transparent, as I mentioned, than um, their big tech counterparts. And they also score much worse on um, in our freedom of expression category, um, but they are improving. Uh, Telefonica was the only uh, European company to make significant progress as well, um, as you see here in the chart with the, the third uh, greatest change. Um, and so, and, and was not only the top company in the overall ranking, but the top in every category. Uh, and one other sort of positive note this year is that no company declined uh, more than half a point. Of course, we never want to see any decline, um, but uh, the declines are small. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, telcos aren't doing so well on freedom of expression. It's the weakest category on average, but also the most improved. Um, and this really relates uh, in, in part to internet shutdowns. Uh, Access Now um, and the Keep It On Coalition have reported somewhere in the neighborhood of 182 or documented 182 shutdowns over the last year. Um, and these remain a, a really critical point um, where telcos are um, presenting risks to freedom of expression. Again, this is compelled by governments, 
Um, they're not taken unilaterally by the telcos themselves, but we do want to know as much as we can about when that uh, pressure has been applied um, so that we can understand what the, what, the, what the threats are and what the situation is. Um, policy enforcement transparency was, was an area uh, it, that saw a decline since 2020. And um, we're also a, a little bit concerned that none of the telcos made any advancements in transparency on how they enforce their own policy, such as detailing behavior that triggers account suspensions or how prevalent those suspensions were. Next slide, please. Another area of concern um, for us is that telcos are also targeting us with ads and using the data that they have access to um, to engage in the same types of practices that big tech um, has been scrutinized for over the last several years. They're using uh, location, um, location data, um, location targeting. There's several, several different ways in which they do this through things like addressable TV. So knowing where you are and targeting ads to you uh, through streaming services um, or through their own uh, uh, connections. There's location-based advertising, which is, is um, increasing. Uh, and they all, because of the level of data that they have, um, have identity systems, or many of them have identity systems and data management platforms, which allow them to create very detailed user profiles that they can then um, leverage to, um, to generate more profits. Um, and they're also operating, uh, in many cases, ad networks. So I think while we've been uh, very vocal as, as digital rights advocates on the threats that big tech poses with regard to targeted advertising, I don't think we can leave telcos out of that equation and that there's a lot more scrutiny that needs to be um, given to them for, for that uh, in, in that realm. And what you see on the um, slide here is some of the ways in which uh, the number of involved companies that, that, that we did a little bit of supplemental research to sort of try and illuminate a little bit more about telcos and targeted advertising um, you can read more in the essay about that, but you can get an idea of how many companies out of the ones that we rank are actually engaging in these services, or not services, but in these practices. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Another area that's long been a concern um, for us is around net neutrality, and in particular, zero rating programs. Um, it was really interesting this year that um, that many of the telcos uh, or five of the telcos that we rank do make strong commitments um, not to violate net neutrality, but several of them continue to offer zero rating programs, which in effect are programs where telcos will partner with big tech companies making access to their particular applications uh, free or not to count against their data plans. Um, so that it, it biases users towards those applications and actually can end up restricting or circumscribing how those users see the internet and what they think um, and the kind of information they can get. Um, again, resulting in, in risks to freedom of expression and freedom of thought and other human rights. Um, zero rating can also jeopardize media pluralism. Uh, it can enable disinformation. It can actually increase broadband costs and, and it distorts competition. Um, it's usually done also as a means of attracting new users and therefore more data. Um, I would like to note, however, that AT&T is the only company that we rank um, that both fully commits to new net neutrality and does not offers any zero rating programs in its home market, which is a positive thing. Um, it seems like zero rating uh, will be coming to an end um, in Europe soon, but I think it's really worth highlighting that it continues um, rampantly in the global south and, um, and, and needs to be um, discontinued. Next slide, please. Also, another threat that telcos pose <clears throat> that are uh, that big tech also poses in some ways, um, but but with telcos, it's it's I think much more severe. Is that there's a lot of inequity between what telcos, the policies that telcos publish um, for their home markets and their their policy transparency in their home markets, versus uh, what happens in their uh, in subsidiaries that they operate, either as majority or minority owners. 
Um, we've been working with a lot of partners in the Global South this year to apply our methodology and design research that helps them illuminate um, what some of the corporate accountability uh, issues and threats are in local markets, and in particular, um, what some of the discrepancies are between how a company operates uh, in at home versus how its subsidiaries operate. Um, of obviously, government influence in some of the sus subsidiary markets will create uh, will create those discrepancies. Um, but we also expect companies, when they see this happening, again, to be transparent about it and to disclose uh, what those discrepancies are. Um, a couple of examples, um, Telenor, uh, the Norwegian telco Telenor's experience in Myanmar um, really exemplifies how telcos with parents in democratic companies, uh, countries are often forced to contradict their stated human rights positions when operating subsidiaries. Um, there was the instance recently where the uh, military junta in, in Myanmar um, wanted to compel both Telenor and Aridu, another company that we rank, uh, to install surveillance equipment on their network or to share user data with them. Telenor and Aridu both exited the country, but were put in a pretty uh, difficult position um, in terms of what happens with their uh, assets, employees, and user data. Um, and so this is one of the points of leverage that governments can have over telecom companies um, that can lead to human rights violations. Other policy discrepancies include um, uh, reporting on um, subsidiaries where, uh, for example, MTN in one of its more recent transparency reports didn't include any data for Iran cell. Um, and America Mobile has released transparency reports for its Latin American operations, but has not done so for its subsidiaries in, in Europe. Um, Vodafone as well has a home operating company, has commitments to net neutrality, but some of its subsidiaries do not. So as much alignment as you know, we can sort of seek with between headquarters in, in democratic countries and subsidiaries operating elsewhere, um, would be a positive development. Finally, or not finally, but next slide, please. <laughs> please. Um, we also, in our category on privacy, we evaluate companies on their data collection and handling. Um, we, as you can see here, there's a, a lot of room for improvement. Um, and, they're a lot less transparent um, when it comes to disclosing what their privacy policies and practices are. Um, and I'll just note that uh, only Deutsche Telekom, the German operator, fully met RDR standards by disclosing that it limited employee access to user information and that it conducted regular internal and external security audit audits. Um, but five companies, including Telenor, did not disclose whether they have a mechanism through which researchers can report vulnerabilities. And many of the telcos we rank also provide very limited options for users to control the use of their personal data and for companies share no information at all, um, where we need to see a lot more improvement. Next slide, please. Telecom companies can also, because of their, um, again, because of their relationship with governments and also with other companies, they can really act as sort of rallying points or, or uh, nodes of surveillance. Um, many telcos or most revealed only a few details about they handle, for example, third party demands for user information. And many users are really unaware of the full scope of the data being collected about them by their telecom operators. In other, in Africa, um, one of the disturbing trends that we've seen, many governments have been forcing telcos to kick mobile users off their plans if they do not agree to link their government ID or biometric ID to a SIM card, uh, which is basically sort of forcing people into a situation of giving up their, or, or making those linkages or being able to uh, communicate effectively. Um, and uh, that 
situation is exacerbated by the fact that many of the countries in question have no functioning data protection law. Um, and it's also possible that some of this data might be repurposed for advertising. Here in the US, um, since the Dobbs versus Jackson decision, earlier this year reversing abortion, the right to, to an abortion, um, state governments that have banned abortion can order companies, telcos and platforms to provide information about their users, geolocation, call records and messaging data. And we'd like to see more policy from telcos uh, that directly addresses what they would do in these situations. Finally, on the next slide, uh, we'll end on a positive note. Um, the environmental, social, and governance investor movement is uh, gaining a lot of traction, and um, particularly in the digital rights space. Um, responsible investors have really been turning up the heat on a lot of uh, the ranked telcos in the last couple of years. And I think that we're seeing some result there in the fact that this is the first year that every ranked telco has published a report um, on their ESG uh, governance. Um, this is a really positive uh, step in the right direction, um, but with the note that most common indices don't cover internet shutdowns or censorship demands, um, and companies can also sort of shop for the most flattering index. Uh, there's also challenges in the fact that many of the standards aren't uh, totally aligned. There's different um, providers for different standards, but we do see some sort of convergence happening there uh, that will make ESG standards uh, sort of what they do is offer a, another lever for pressure um, by engaging investor investors in particular in sort of the um, in the push for human rights. Um, and in a in a really positive note for RDR, um, we are really excited to see that um, the GSMA, the world's largest uh, mobile industry group, cited. Um, sort of wrapped a bunch of our recommendations or our standards into one of its own proposed standards on digital integrity as part of um, new standards that it's creating for its members. And on the next slide, I just also would like to highlight for anyone that would like to do uh, research according to our methodology and standards um, on companies in their local market or perhaps uh, ISPs or, or other types of companies. Um, we've recently launched the RDR Research Lab, which sort of walks people through um, our approach to designing research for corporate accountability. Um, it is open and we would love for, for others to adopt it and adapt it. Um, and uh, so I wanted to make sure that I let you know you can produce similar research and scorecards to the ones that we've done here. Finally, um, the next slide, um, I would encourage you any questions that you have as a result of sort of this very brief presentation of our findings uh, to put them in the Slido box. Uh, and uh, our panelists, um, as uh, Vesna leads that discussion, may be able to answer some of them. And so for the moment, um, I want to thank everyone again for being here. And then I would like to turn over uh, our panel or our launch of this launch event to Vesna Vesanar, who is our scorecards program manager. Um, and uh, she will lead us and our excellent panelists in a, in a really interesting discussion, I'm sure, on sort of where are telcos and where are we going. Vesna? Thanks, Jess, uh, and welcome everyone as well. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're joining from. I'm joining from Budapest, uh, Hungary. I'm the program manager at Ranking Digital Rights, and I'll be moderating the session. Um, and again, please feel free to drop your questions. We'll be monitoring them. Um, I would like to invite our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, uh, starting with uh, Laura and then Jason and then Thomas, and then we turn to the first question. Thank you, Vesna. Uh, my name is Laura Okkonen, or Laura Okkonen. Um, I work with Access Now as an investor advocate. Um, Access Now is a global civil, uh, civil society organization that's working to uh, extend and defend human rights in the online space across the globe. Um, I'm personally based in Helsinki, 
at Finland. And prior to joining Access Now, I actually spent close to two decades working in the telco sector, leading business and human rights programs. So I'm really delighted to, to be here today and actually contributing from this perspective, having been on the receiving end um, as a corporate representative earlier. Um, so really happy to be here. And uh, thank you for the kind invite to Market Digital Rights. I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, thanks very much to RDR for the invitation to participate. My name is Jason Pilemeyer. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Network Initiative. GNI is a multi-stakeholder organization that brings together uh, tech companies from across the tech spectrum, including, of course, telcos, equipment vendors, uh, content management companies, cloud companies, uh, a real broad range. We also have uh, members who are uh, civil society organizations such as RDR. Um, we also have academic individuals and institutions and investors as members. So it's a very big tent uh, and all of these different actors come together under GMI's umbrella to work on protecting free expression and privacy in the space between governments and companies. So where companies and governments are interacting, where companies are on the receiving end of demands, pressures or restrictions from governments. Um, and RDR and, and GNI have um, sort of long been linked historically. The um, founder of uh, RDR, Rebecca McKinnon, was a, a founding board member of GNI, and I think has talked publicly about how RDR was created in part to supplement GNI because GNI conducts assessments of our company conduct, but they are done in a confidential manner uh, based on information that is not public as well as publicly available information. And RDR, of course, complements that by looking uh, at the information that companies make public. So looking forward to getting into some of those distinctions and differences uh, and talking more about this report. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dan. I'll conclude. Um, hello, my name is Thomas Loninger. I'm very glad and thankful for the introduction to this um, great project that's released today. I'm Executive Director of Epicenter Works. We are an Austrian-based digital rights organization, and I'm also Vice President of ADRI, European Digital Rights. I'm usually based in Vienna, but right now I'm in Brussels, and my connection with the telecom world is um, twofold. Uh, first, when we are fighting against surveillance legislation, we very often find ourselves on the same side with telcos and um, fighting alongside with them against um, government overreach but at the same time a lot of our work is focused on net neutrality um, for the past decade we've been trying to get net neutrality in Europe um, and not just the law but also get it enforced and in that capacity I've uh, very often found myself on the opposite side of the telecom industry at their shareholder gatherings but also in many many lobby meetings here in Brussels. Thanks, Saul. Um, I would have a lot of follow-up questions on your on your organizations already, but let's start um, with looking at the findings and uh, what you found most interesting. I, of course, have a lot of a lot of aspects of our research that I found very interesting, but I would be curious to hear what you um, were surprised by or what you found um maybe something that you don't agree with or you think you have a different position on um i think one of the big uh, messages that we, we we see or like what something that is very obvious is that uh telecom companies are somehow less transparent on a lot of the issues that we look at um and i would be curious to to hear what you think why is that um um maybe we could start with uh, laura first Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, these are very good questions. And um, as always, as every year, it's super interesting to, to see the, the latest results from, from the Ranking Digital Rights Index. And I think that there's there's something, there's a there's one thing among many that keeps popping up every year. And, and that's actually something that Jessica also mentioned in her introduction. And, and that's the issues related to uh, network shutdowns. And um, the the 182 network shutdowns that, that Jessica mentioned that were actually documented by Access Now in our Keep It On campaign for 2021, 
those took place in 34 countries. So that's 34 countries across the globe. So this is by no means a local issue. It's, it's a global issue. And it seems as if this is a record high number, just to give you some perspective. And it almost seems as if authorities in specific countries are increasingly using shutdowns as a tool to censor national events, which always incite, uh, and, and they tend to always incite national security concerns. And the reason why I want to bring this up is the fact that as critical infrastructure providers, telcos are required to comply uh, with law enforcement assistant requests. And network shutdown requests are an example of a law enforcement assistant request. So whenever we're discussing network shutdowns, we're also discussing telcos who, who comply with these requests in shutting down, throttling, or imposing service restrictions uh, for their users. Um, but having said that, on the positive side, I think it's worth acknowledging and mentioning the fact that um, uh, that uh, some of the the newer per, newer performance in the index MTN specifically, uh, they they've come a really long way. It's been very impressive uh, in in terms of their performance, and also the fact that they have joined the GNI. They've published a transparency report. Um, that's something that we we should not take for granted because it does take a lot of work um, internally in a company to commit to such big steps. Uh, to, to respect uh, human rights and protect users. But at the same time, the declining scores for some of the European telcos also indicate that there's no space for complacency. Um, companies need to remain committed uh, to their human rights work and to transparency, regardless of potential internal or external turmoil uh, around them. Um, but I think I'll pause here and um, hand it back over to you, Ishna. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Yes, I agree. Like um, with the European telcos, um, they have like somehow. I always feel like um, they get maybe too comfortable. Um, and uh, some things that we've seen is actually that uh, some of them stopped publishing or updating their transparency reports, and uh, and after pointing that out, they they returned to that. But that's somehow like seems like a trend, a varying trend, uh, various, like as you pointed out, uh, with companies uh, like MTN, um, they are turning to to publishing their first ever transparency reports uh, these years. So uh, that's an interesting point. Um, and those are the companies which are actually more exposed to government pressure in a lot of the cases as well uh, on the ground. So maybe if since we talked about network uh, shutdowns, I turn to Thomas uh, to see what what's your take uh, on the TGS, which is the tax client card. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I mean on on net neutrality, of course, that is. Um, the huge issue where um, we seem to really uh, have made a lot of progress since last year in some world regions. Um, it was already mentioned that uh, the European High Court, uh, in a surprise ruling, confirmed what we have been telling to regulators since 2016, that uh, zero rating in effect is a violation of uh, and user rights and needs to be prohibited. Now we have that ruling since um, late of last year and the regulators thankfully have done a good job in implementing it. And um, we see now a clear uh, road ahead of the extinction of all remaining zero rating products. They can no longer be marketed in most countries. And so Europe hopefully will soon join. Um, India and Canada as a restriction in which zero rating is clearly illegal. Um, and I really see this as the most worrying factor on a global scale right now, because particularly in the global south, um, so much of the internet experiences of people is shaped by the decision of telecom companies, which services can be accessed and which can be not. And um, we have done extensive research in uh, Europe who are actually the beneficiaries of these zero rating products and um, four out of the top 10 apps were from one company from Meta um, and only three from the top 20 were actually from Europe. So zero rating is always a way to cement the market position of the most dominant global players and that has been confirmed in 
Uh, another activity we did, the Constitutional Court of Columbia recently asked us to give testimony because they are hearing a case on zero rating, which could really be a watershed moment. Uh, the Constitutional Court of Columbia has really taken a lot of time to investigate this issue thoroughly and invited many international experts to give testimony. And the opinions by the experts is actually quite clear that zero rating is a human rights violation. By the way, also in Colombia, the main beneficiary of these products, of these programs, is Meta with their services, Facebook, um, Instagram, and WhatsApp. Um, and that situation is the same in Brazil, in many African countries. So I think many people are now looking at the court in Colombia to hopefully get a favorable ruling. It's expected in January, February. And no matter the outcome, I think um, this issue deserves much more global attention. Um, if we were to look closer, who are actually the services that get this special access, we would see that um, it is very often the companies that we in the West are criticizing, rightfully so, for their impact. And if you just simply think about the fact when it comes to fake news, if you only have WhatsApp as a means of communication, and you're not even able to click on the link that's sent to you to verify whether at least that confirms with the message that you received. So I, I really think that we need to um, focus a little bit more when it comes to freedom of expression and responsibility the telecom operators have um, and uh, simply being bribed by big tech in order to um, have them in the prime position to these new markets is just not a tenable situation. Thanks, Thomas. And um, yeah, I can very much relate to that because we've had many discussions with companies as well, asking them, like, how can you commit to net neutrality and offer zero rating program at the same time? And, and usually uh, the answer was that, like, well, in our national legislation, it's not illegal to do so. So um, that is where, like, I guess uh, it's... Uh, you can expect companies to go beyond uh, legal requirements that 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 doesn't really happen uh, in most of the cases. Um, Jason, I'm very curious uh, what you think about our findings. Thanks, Rosa. So maybe I'll pick up on the question that you asked about sort of why perhaps telcos are not as transparent as um, as some other companies. Um, I think there's probably a, a variety of answers. Uh, that account for that and, and maybe slightly different in each company's case. Um, one thing that I think you know we, we have to acknowledge from the start is that um, telcos and internet companies, the kinds of companies that are ranked in the big tech scorecard, um, you know, operate at, at very different levels of sort of profit margins and, and resources. Um, that is not in any way an excuse for not being transparent. Um, but I think it does have implications. And, and I'm curious, I mean, I think this report was produced over a period during the pandemic um, when um, in particular, I think telcos were, were, you know, resource constraints were a real thing. Um, a number of the companies in the report uh, ended up significantly changing uh, their footprint globally, withdrawing from certain markets and sort of restructuring their approaches, consolidating you know, in particular profitable markets. And so there's been a lot of change in the telco sector in this period, um, which, you know, has really more to do with kind of broader economic and, and pandemic effects. Um, but, but it'd be interesting perhaps to explore how some of that may have had ramifications for um, uh, the findings of the report. I think another really important and probably obvious to everyone on this call distinction to, to highlight is the fact that telcos operate uh, in a different legal framework than um, uh, than over the top companies or uh, content uh, user content uh, user generated content companies, um, and that is because telcos um, generally have to um, you know they have to comply with domestic legal laws just like any other company, but they specifically have to agree to licensing conditions in order to be able to access the uh, internal um, communications infrastructure. Uh, to be able to build out additional infrastructure um, and the, both the specific terms of the law and the related licensing agreement and the regulatory oversight of those activities is much more um, developed in most cases than it is vis-a-vis -vis, uh, user-generated content companies. Um, now, that's beginning to change as we see more and more governments take a more proactive approach to uh, uh, content 
related services. Um, I don't think that's a good thing necessarily. We saw earlier this year, just, just uh, last month, the government of India proposing in its new telecommunications bill um, uh, to create the authority to require uh, what they call over-the-top companies to uh, register for licenses in the same way that telecommunications do, uh, telecommunications companies do. And um, I think that would have some pretty significant and, and largely negative impacts for free expression uh, and privacy. Um, we said as much in a statement that, that G and I put out a uh, submission to that uh, the consultation around that draft telecom bill. So we can go down that path later if that would be of interest, but I think that's an important distinction. Um, I think um, uh, it's also just worth recognizing when it comes to the interaction between these companies and government, um, though the fact that the, the telecom companies are there uh, pursuant to a licensing arrangement, the fact that they have to have, by virtue of their, their operational footprint, um, both large staff in country, as well as you know large investments of equipment, uh, um, they therefore are um, under more pressure uh, from the local government. The government has more leverage over them uh, than that same government would have over a Meta or a Google, who may or may not have staff in country, um, who, who don't necessarily have uh, significant equipment. They don't need to have servers in every country where they operate um, and tend to take decisions very carefully about where they will put uh, both staff and, and physical infrastructure. Uh, including looking at human rights considerations. So telcos, uh, once they're in the country, um, you know, are, are going to be uh, more vulnerable to government pressure, uh, and that can certainly have impacts on transparency. So those are sort of some high-level kind of um, distinctions that maybe are worth drawing out. I'm happy to go into any of that later if that would be useful. Thank you. That's very helpful. That's something we've also been discussing a lot, actually, when we started thinking about the outputs for the Taco Giants court card. And um, these things that you mentioned came up a lot. Um, but the other thing that we also discussed it, it is that maybe this is only for us, but it feels like that there's less scrutiny uh, on tacos or like we we tend to focus a lot more on, um, on digital platforms, big tech companies. Um, so I'm wondering like if this is just, um, um, our feeling or this is something that we see or feel because of uh, the media and information env environment or if you all think that that tacos are actually getting a pass uh, on digital rights and uh, um, what happened to to the critical discourse around telecommunications companies uh, which was uh, much more prominent uh, six or seven years ago and uh, it, it seems to be um, less visible these days um, Thomas yeah, I can I can try to answer that. I mean, um, I've I've also been around. I think uh, like in 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 the digital rights field before and after the shift has happened, um, and it certainly has happened. Um, but it's important to still keep the frame of big tech and big telco, um, because we are speaking uh, on, on both accounts on about very powerful, multi-billion global companies that have a tremendous impact on how we can use digital technology and uh, um, how our fundamental rights are impacted by these technologies. Um, if you would weigh the potential for damage, then of course, I think big tech still comes out on top. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's rare that the company would measure the hiccups in, in uh, genocides as uh, Facebook was saying, ah, let's not have another Myanmar. Um, and um, of course, uh, telcos are uh, localized companies, and so there's um, the government influence, as was mentioned, is rightfully something that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, um, but it's also something where we need exactly projects like this on the global community that is watchful. Um, I went myself on the street with a huge group of activists from our organization and from uh, local diaspora because A1 the Telecom Austria um, uh, was um, shutting down the internet in the midst of the Belarus um, democracy protests. 
um, and they were entering that market knowing that this is the last dictatorship of Europe, knowing that they would allow the government to basically shut them off at any time because um, they are gated from the rest of the internet with a state-owned um, uh, intermediary. Um, and so there is a human rights uh, obligation on telecom companies, and they're not just like any other business. Um, and the differences when it comes to regulation um, should not overlook the differences when it comes to human rights obligations to these types of companies. Um, and um, I think we have yet to grapple efficient remedies to really address these shutdowns. OSGI has recently launched an OSCE complaint against AA1 because of Belarus. That's definitely one avenue, litigation. But I think just public pressure and projects like these are also important to remind them on their obligation and to frame that the big tech is bad and therefore we should give big telco a pass. That's certainly wrong. Both have their unique responsibility. Uh, and, and particularly when it comes to any form of net neutrality violation, net neutrality is never the solution to all of the problems. But if you fail to get net neutrality right, we have lost all of the other problems as well. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Just maybe jumping in with, with some additional thoughts um, on, on, on the whole issue of whether telcos are, are getting the pass or what happened to that, that active discussion from six or seven years ago. Um, I'd say that your argument is probably too, to a certain extent, because the, back then, six or seven years ago, the, the, the focus on telcos was really focused, that the discussion was focused on how and whether telcos comply with law enforcement assistance requests. Um, that was really the, the gist of it when it came to, to digital rights. And um, today there's, a, I would argue that there, perhaps there is a general awareness already that in many countries, tacos are legally unable to acknowledge or confirm that re requests are being received. And um, this is also, it, this information is also very evident if you, if you read the, the telco transparency reports. Uh, however, that discussion needs to continue because the issues remain, uh, like network shutdowns. Uh, uh, but I would also perhaps note that that discussion needs to continue to, to include an additional element on government accountability, also in enforcing regulation that makes it uh, possible for, for companies to be transparent in this respect. Um, I would also argue that perhaps Part of the, the reasons why telcos are telcos can be perceived to, to be flying under the radar to a certain extent is that uh, their business models are changing. It's not only about LEA requests anymore. It's also about things like targeted advertising and the, the telco sector's increasing public sector business through their IoT solutions. Uh, and, you know, uh, with, with targeted advertising, it's logical, in my opinion, that telcos are trying to benefit financially from the business models, which have been so profitable for social media platform companies. But in their haste to join the chase for advertisers, I think that perhaps telcos should also pause to understand the specific issues and the risks that we've been discussing for so long with regards to the social media platforms, because they actually have the not only the responsibility, but an opportunity here to try to find some of the solutions to, to issues related to such things as, as targeted advertising in a, in a rights respecting manner. Um, so unfortunately, I, I, I'm not, we're not seeing telcos doing that, uh, pausing and trying to find solutions in, in, in some of the issues related to targeted advertising. Uh, again, because that business has proved to be very lucrative uh, for the social media companies. Um, in addition to targeted advertising, uh, another one that I, asked, I also mentioned is the increasing IoT business, the public sector business that telcos are, are in in many countries. And while it's not really consumer facing, um, I think it's important to understand that part of the, the, their business model better as well because it also often involves telcos uh, doing business directly with oppressive regimes 
to improve the the country's overall digital infrastructure, but also to do different public sector projects uh, like smart cities uh, for for the governments of of these countries. And in discussing transparency um, and the telcos need to be transparent, I'm wondering to what extent that that balance uh, or that aspiration for transparency is being impacted not only because of the, the regulation that prevents them from doing so, but also uh, the by the increasing financial potential financial benefits if, if they work nice, play nice with those governments. So there are many things that are changing also with the telco sector and their business models. So perhaps we are also just at that point where there's a there's a next step next stage of the the telco evolution uh, that's happening at the moment the, the the earlier discussion is is sort of clear what the issues are and the next one with the next ones or the new challenges we're just not quite there yet um, having said that i think that what all companies big tech and telcos alike should keep in mind that trans the expectation for transparency is always there, regardless of your business model and the business you're in, in, in any given country. So that hasn't changed. And that underlying theme for transparency should be carried out to whatever business models they develop. But um, again, I think I'll pause here. Uh, Thank you. That was um, a very comprehensive analysis, I think. And uh, I'd like to follow up on that and also what Thomas was talking about in relation to operating in in oppressive and authoritarian regimes and that's something also someone asked from the audience and i think like that's coming up a lot in our discussion as well um it's like what is what is it that a telecom company can do when they choose to enter uh, an oppressive uh, or, or like a dictatorship in case of belarus and i think like I understand your argument, uh, Thomas, when you were saying like, well, they decided to do that on the first place, so they should also like uh, uh, act in accordance uh, to that decision. But then um, there's also an argument saying like, well, those people in Belarus actually need uh, need to be able to connect uh, somehow um, um, to the web. So I think uh, that's something I'm sure telecom companies struggle a lot with as well. And um, and I would love to, I don't think there's a clear answer to like, what is their responsibility? What is their role? How do she, how should they operate in authoritarian regimes? But I think it would be great to hear some of your thoughts around like, what can they do? Um, maybe if you could talk a little bit about responsible disengagement, because that's something also we see that uh, companies like Telenor actually need to leave the market uh, for, for human rights reasons and not just business reasons. Um, I don't know who would like to go first. Um, if no one... I'm you sure can. that there are others. Jason probably has a better global perspective on this. My, yeah, my brief would... hot take would be that um, I mean, human rights impact assessment, you already said it, and we have good examples from the industry, um, Telenor, Dr. Telecom, um, and others that, that have done these human rights impact assessments and came to the conclusion that certain markets neither have the rule of law uh, requirements, uh, uh, nor, nor the fundamental rights protections to operate uh, such a vital service like a telecom infrastructure in a responsible manner. And um, therefore, it's better to divest or to um, to to never enter the market in in the first place. Um, of course, that leads to the question: Who enters instead? Um, and and there is sadly no easy solution that 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 uh, I can come up with. But it does not uh, alleviate me as as um, a human rights organization in the country where this um, company is headquartered to remind them of. Uh, um, the role they played uh, and it's not just a shutdown uh, it's also uh, handing out location data around demonstrations um, intercepting telecommunications content data from opposition leaders there are all likes of things where suddenly the telecom will find itself in a in a very difficult position um, and um, um, yeah thanks yeah, and I I can jump in there as well. And at some point, maybe useful also to go back to the, the question about um, sort of 
why has there been less attention on telcos that, that you asked earlier? I, I think you know, Laura was outlining that there is a real change happening in the in the business models and the approaches. Um, I think especially with 5G technology, we're going to see um, you know kind of more convergence in terms of the types and you know the report points out the targeted advertising um, sort of approach that is now more and more available to telecom operators, and I think. We're going to start to see more blurring of lines in terms of some of the classical distinctions that we thought about between what, you know, what a business model and what kinds of operational challenges and what kinds of legal uh, framework issues uh, a telco company has versus a, a, a content um, management company or a, a user generated content company. So we can come back to that. But on this question of kind of authoritarian regimes or dealing with difficult jurisdictions. It's a it's a really important and and in some ways sort of highly philosophical question and I think um, you know Tomas outlined it well you know kind of the pros and cons um, within GNI you know our approach is not to say you know to draw hard lines or to come up with lists of countries and say you can't go into there's no way you could operate responsibly in this country or that this country. Um, uh, we do what we do is make sure that uh, the, the companies who are members of GNI have the proper systems and processes in place, including human rights impact assessments as part of a broader human rights due diligence framework to make sure that they're asking these questions, not just at the point of deciding whether to bid on a license or to enter a country, um, but throughout their operations and on an ongoing basis, uh, consistent with the broader UN guidance principles on business and human rights. Um, when we do our assessment, uh, which is the periodic exercise through which uh, we bring in independent assessors to look at internal systems and policies that these companies have developed uh, to implement the GNI framework uh, and figure out how that's working in practice, to identify learnings from, from those experiences and to share them with our board, that's a confidential exercise. But as you can imagine, um, we end up focusing quite a bit on these types of jurisdictions, other jurisdictions that um, have had recurring rule of law and human rights challenges or jurisdictions that have shifted over time. And that's something we also have to acknowledge is that a, a company might decide to go into a country uh, at a certain time when things, you know, maybe um, aren't so bad. And then over time, as is the case in Myanmar, um, there can be changes. Those changes can happen slowly or, or in the Myanmar case can happen quite, quite quickly and abruptly. Not to say that those potential outcomes weren't foreseeable or, or at least um, you know you know couldn't have been anticipated as a possibility but um, all of these sorts of dynamics factor into um, the decisions that a company has to make um, I think you know personally just speaking for myself here I think it would be a perverse and an, an unintended probably outcome of um, the broader conversation around business and human rights if we ended up in a world where Western companies or companies with more developed human rights policies, um, and it's not just Western companies, as this report uh, illustrates very well and very helpfully. Um, but if those kinds of companies that take their sort of human rights and, and sort of broader business and human rights responsibilities seriously end up avoiding uh, operating in countries where there are significant risks, um, I think that uh, that will end up having. Um, more negative effects for the users in those countries, um, for the potential for those companies to be part of a broader project of opening of transformation, um, than would be the case if, uh, um, you know, uh, if they if they are willing and able to to take risks like Telenor did going into a, a market like Myanmar, um, notwithstanding the challenges that they knew they would have uh, and the potential. Uh, for 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 you know the kind of backsliding that we have since seen, um, so it's a fine line. I think you know different digital rights activists make uh, decisions about how they want to advocate around that issue, um, uh, and I think um, it can be really challenging for the companies because uh, sometimes they feel like you know they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. Um, but it, it's definitely a conversation that's really important to have, and I'm really glad that that you know you all have highlighted that, and and I think that's um, something that we can you know certainly talk about more um, in public spaces as well as private ones um, to really just understand um, the, the pros and cons and how we can work constructively, collectively um, to incentivize companies to operate responsibly even in the most challenging circumstances. 
Thank you, Jason. I, I think I have a follow-up question on that that is actually addressed, I would like to address to you, which is about how can we help companies uh, in doing that? And I think um, it would be very interesting to hear about your experience, GNI's experience uh, in terms of engaging with telecom companies, um, if it has been different in any way from engaging with big tech companies, for instance, and and what, I mean, you've already mentioned a lot of the challenges, but um, what benefits do you see in taking part or participating in such multi-stakeholder initiatives or like just in general engaging with uh, civil society? And then maybe if Laura and Thomas, you could talk about your experience, um, experiences with engaging with companies or Laura, if you can talk about your experience as a company representative engaging with civil society in general, I think that would be helpful um, to hear about that. Yeah, so um, very quickly on the question, so what we can do more broadly, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about sort of what GNI does. Um, I think one thing that would be helpful, and I was thinking about this as I was reading the, the executive summary and the framing for this report, um, is to acknowledge that, you know, the companies that you have looked at here are a relatively small slice of the overall uh, industry. And that's even more the case with the Telco Giants report than it is with the big tech scorecard. Like the big tech scorecard focuses on the biggest companies, and the biggest companies in terms of the user base really do represent the vast majority of the services that people interact with around the world on a day to day basis. On the Telco side, um, many people on this call and, and most people in the world have a telco provider that is not covered in this report, right? And I know RDR has been doing great work to open source the methodology and to, to you know, help facilitate and encourage more uh, sort of regional and country specific work. And that's, that's a really good thing. But I just think in terms of framing the conclusions of this report, it, it can be easy to look at this report and say, oh gosh, all these companies, you know, they all got a failing grade. They're not doing very well. But if you compare these companies to you know, the vast majority of telecommunications companies, including state-owned telecommunications companies uh, that are out there in the world, um, they all of a sudden look a lot better in terms of the kinds of you know um, public guarantees that they provide, and then you know um, uh, implicitly beyond that, you know what they might be doing internally that they, they can't or they aren't yet uh, talking about publicly. Um, so I think that a little bit of that kind of context and perspective would be useful um, because I know that companies sometimes feel like. You know they're getting beat up on despite the fact that they are in just you know they're leaders among their peers right but they are the ones despite that who are getting this, this very rigorous uh and and sometimes quite critical attention um so that's one thing and to, to speak about what gni does um and the conversations we've had with telco so this year we uh, are just concluding our uh, fourth assessment cycle as an organization gni has been around for 12 years um so the assessments occur every three years um, this is the second cycle where we have had equipment vendors and telecommunications companies um, part of this cycle. It, the, there was a group that joined in 2017, uh, and, and Laura was a part of that when she was at Nokia. Um, and, um, and it's been really interesting to see um, as they have gone through now their second assessment. The, the GNI assessment um, framework is oriented towards identifying for each company whether they are implementing the GNI principles and implementation guidelines in good faith with improvement over time. And obviously that second part, the improvement over time can only happen in once you've started to have subsequent assessments because you have a benchmark against which to, to measure improvement. Um, and um, so I can't talk about the details uh, and the findings um, uh, of that. We haven't finished it yet. We will put out a public assessment report next year that will talk about the process and some of the learnings and where possible, we'll talk about some of the details and key studies and things like that. But but in general, I would just say, you know, it's been interesting to see the progress over time um, and to see, you know, how telecommunications companies are um, able to learn from some companies that are in sort of other adjacent sectors, whether that's equipment vendors or whether that's, um, you know, user generated content, uh, content platforms, um, and vice versa, right? And I, I alluded to this earlier, but, you know, we are seeing um, a shift in the global legal, legal framework with more and more countries um, requiring um, user-generated content companies to um, put staff in country and make them um, sort of legally available and sometimes responsible uh, and, and, and liable for potential violations of domestic law. Um, that is a dynamic that telecommunications companies have been dealing with for decades. 
right? And so uh, there are potential lessons that uh, the companies that are now being forced into that uncomfortable situation can learn uh, from telecommunications companies. Um, there are um, all kinds of very interesting experiences that companies uh, have in different jurisdictions um, with you know, kind of innovative approaches to dealing with government demands um, that they can share in this confidential space um, that other uh, companies can pick up on uh, and potentially um, adopt. And I think that's a, a, another thing we've seen more and more of in this cycle as companies sort of uh, become more accustomed to the assessment process and, and more information is, is shared. Um, so I think there's, you know, from where I sit, there's a lot of really rich um, learning and a lot of um, notable progress um, um, that we're seeing, and, and that's great. Um, I understand that, that some people would be frustrated by the fact that that is all happening confidentially and behind uh, a kind of a closed door that, that they can't necessarily peek into. Um, mm. But my hope is, and this is, I think, consistent with the sort of the RDR mission, um, is that as companies become more comfortable talking about these things in a closed door environment with other stakeholders, including some in civil society and academia who are often quite critical publicly of those same companies, um, that they will eventually become more comfortable also releasing that information more broadly to the public um, and to having more conversations around those topics with stakeholders who are not necessarily GNI members. Um, so, you know, over time, I think that has been the trend um, mm -hmm. with, with some of the companies that have been GNI members for, for a long time. Um, and, and I'm optimistic that that will continue to be the trend. Um, so uh, I'll just stop there and hand it to others. Thank you, Jason. Um, Laura? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, experiences on, on and, and potential benefits in engaging with, with civil society from a company perspective. Um, well, to be honest, um, I, I hope that the, the fact that I, cho I chose to leave the telco sector and join the civil society is a testament of my positive experiences in engaging with civil society from, from the past. And that really truly was always immensely valuable uh, in, in not only in doing what we did on a daily basis, but testing out new ideas and really trying to understand what adds value, what information in terms of disclosures, for example, adds value for the civil society. What is the information that they need? And um, Access Now was already in the picture uh, about 10 years ago um, with, with, with my work. And um, I think that one of the keys for the for the business and human rights personnel in, in the corporate sector is to really try to understand and identify those critical friends from the civil society who will who will provide that value at for you, who understand your business and who are able to critically uh, assess the information or the ideas that you want to discuss them with. And, and in that regard, I really have to hand it out to the RDR as well, because I I I do you remember from personal experience the, the amount of time that the RDR takes to engage with all the participating companies to make sure that you provide an opportunity for the companies to comment on, on the preliminary results and to, to let you know if, if something if, if there's something that they do not agree with or so on. So I can only imagine the amount of time that takes uh, from the overall assessment. Uh, but Having said that, I think that uh, RDR, the RDR and Access Now are very good examples of efficient corporate engagement that actually adds value for, for both parties. Because in that process, I would argue that uh, both parties learn from one another as well. So with that. Um, Thank you. Um, I, when you started talking, I started thinking about how difficult it was sometimes for us to actually explain the importance of transparency to some of the companies. And um, and I'm wondering, like, uh, if Thomas, if you had very similar experiences, because I think, like, as Laura was saying, on the civil society side, sometimes we don't understand the internal business considerations and how the business is built, but then we have our human rights demands. And then um, from the company's side, it's uh, sometimes I had the feeling that there is like uh, not a, the same understanding around the importance of transparency and the freedom of information. And um, and I wonder if, if Thomas, you had a similar experience. 
I mean, um, I, I, I can definitely agree with Laura that uh, there is a huge benefit from mutual learning and uh, that the always, one should always enter into these debates with an open mind and uh, uh, with the expectation to be surprised to learn something new and not to have too many preconceptions uh, about the other side. Um, but I, I, I do believe that also companies have something like in DNA. Um, Meta will not suddenly become a good company in the metaverse. And uh, telecom companies inherently come from the telephony era. And you can see that in so many of their strategic decisions. It takes your rating. They, 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 they want to sell more than just the gigabytes or the minutes as it were before. They want to diversify their products. And um, they, they, they are used to termination monopolies. They are used to getting money for a call to terminate. That's why they want to have right now in Europe and in India, we have the similar debate, want to have money from the content providers that uh, get accessed by their paying customers. Um, so I think there, there is always a part of the company around the business model that you can never change. But that is very important to understand. And then about new products, I think one can actually achieve a lot with these types of discourses. But ultimately, I have to be the um, clunky European here and say that I believe much more in government regulation than companies' ability to change on their own. Thank you. And I think that's a nice... Um bridge to, to maybe the last part of our conversation. We have uh, almost uh, 15 minutes left. So all of you mentioned something about the future of the taco industry. Jason, you talked about the 5G um, chain, that, the changes that 5G will bring um, to the telecom community. Uh, Laura, you talked about how targeted advertising um, and like the move into the targeted advertising business of tacos uh, have uh, human rights implications and, and how they are not really thinking, or at least it seems like they are not really thinking about um, all the things that civil society has been raising the alarm around. Um, Thomas, you also, also mentioned uh, net neutrality as a key issue that we should be focusing on as like the number one or like maybe the first step that needs to needs to be fulfilled in order to enable the rest of the uh, human rights uh, related to tacos. So I'd like to invite you to maybe um, offer a few forward looking um, concluding remarks what are the issues that you think tacos and civil society um, working with tacos should be focusing on uh, maybe Laura you could talk a little bit about the investor work uh, that you are doing and how you think the investor work that we've been doing around big tech companies could be translated into the taco industry um, so um, should we start uh, with you Laura maybe Sure, happy to, to get us going. Um, I think this is partly tied to the to the previous previous question and the previous discussion. But in my past experience, um, not very many investors engage directly with their portfolio companies on human rights issues, and I completely understand that it's logical given the size of of their portfolios in in most cases, uh, and. In, in some respects, the, the investors who do engage with telco companies uh, may be slightly limited in their understanding of, of the business models or the, the most salient issues, the most salient human rights issues for the company or for the sector, uh, especially when it comes to the downstream activities, including uh, the use of the company's products and, and services. And, Again, I fully understand that, given the, the size of, of, of the, the, the investor portfolios, and, and they just simply do not have the bandwidth, probably, uh, or specific human rights expertise to evaluate or to interpret, interpret um, the, the responses provided by the companies. And by no means am I suggesting that investors uh, should become human rights experts. But what investors can and should consider doing is, is engaging more with civil society organizations to, to benefit from um, the experience and the expertise from the civil society organizations. Um, there are many organizations, including Access Now, that um, focuses specifically on big tech and, and uh, telco and digital rights issues. And um, 
the, one of the things that's probably often on, uh, overlooked is the fact that when civil society organizations uh, hope to engage with the, the investor community or the, the business community as such, it's not always directly related to advocacy efforts. So engaging with civil society does not mean automatically equate to your company will be in the news the next day. And I think it's really important to, to take that leap of faith and start working together more closely on mutual um, interests. Because after all, at the end of the day, uh, when civil society organizations are interested in business and human rights and corporate accountability, that's the end goal, enforcing corporate accountability. And that's a mutual goal that's probably, I would imagine, shared by civil society organizations and the investor community on their portfolio companies. So there is room for, for more collaboration. And obviously, collaboration, um, efficient collaboration takes time to develop because it also, also obviously always takes uh, trust, requires trust as well. Um, so I would just maybe like to close by uh, extending an open invitation for the investor community to consider engaging with, with civil society on specific issues that you may want to learn more about or about specific tech companies or telco companies that you are engaging with because uh, it is possible to also consult civil society and um, benefit from that experience. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, Thomas? Yeah, I, I, um, I definitely see some um, optimistic outlook when it comes to these types of, of uh, corporations, um, but maybe not in the area where you expect it. I mean, we work a lot with corporations when it comes to um, issues close to us like there are many companies that build their businesses around privacy friendly technologies um, around interoperability which we see as a very important tool of antitrust of uh, um, competition because um, I mean it's obvious that certain companies are just far too big um, to, to still be healthy and splitting them up is is, is uh, the way to go, but as an intermediary step, because politicians seem to be unwilling to do that on both sides of the Atlantic, um, interoperability is a meaningful way to get the internet open and decentral again. And that has unique privacy and security concerns that need to be addressed, but working together with the corporations that are building the technology to allow this interoperability um, across the data silos to break up um, the, um, the monolithic blocks of social networks. Um, we see this right now with Twitter. Um, Mastodon, thankfully, is an alternative. It's not the alternative that we need in all of its dimensions, but um, that's exactly the discussion that we should ha be having um, because uh, these infrastructures are all too important to just be left to individual billionaires or also to shareholders, in my opinion. Um, and then there is another thing that I just wanted to mention, um, Trust PID. Um, we, we discussed this um, before the panel and uh, this new project from uh, Vodafone and Deutsche Telekom, uh, which is, uh, again, a way to, to um, have a solution for targeted advertisement at the end of cookies. Um, but it's so clearly a violation of privacy laws and, and um, I think, uh, yes, of course, every type of discussion is welcome, but uh, at one point, one has also to say that um, breaking the law is not an innovative business practice, and um, there, there's also a job of regulators and law, of law enforcement at one point to, to also put a stop to certain things. And mm -hmm. I, I, um, I think, again, understanding the decisions that have led to, up to certain projects is important, um, but only in so far as they hopefully will not be repeated. Thank you, Thomas. And um, before I turn to, turn to Jason, I just would like to remind the audience that this is your last chance to put any questions that you would like to ask because we are concluding our discussion very soon. And um, Jason, the floor is yours. 
All right, I will try and keep it brief. Um, so uh, a few things, I think, um, picking up on, on some of what Laura was saying, I think that um, one thing that, you know, I mentioned earlier, the sort of um, economic environment um, and some of the challenges and changes that that's brought to the sector, I think simultaneously one thing, another thing that we have been seeing is more uh, pressure from investors to for telecommunications companies to focus on a broader range of economic, social, and governance issues. Um, like so, anti-corruption has always been a focus for investors for companies broadly, um, and it's a very material risk given some of the, the legal consequences um, uh, for violating uh, different laws in different jurisdictions, which can extend globally. Environmental issues, I think, are increasingly becoming a focus for investors, right? And so having um, better internal focus and more uh, sort of external auditing and accountability for how companies are meeting certain climate change and other objectives. And those are all great. I think the challenge that we're hearing about, though, is that um, this is to some extent spreading thin the teams of people and, and the resources that are available to address ESG issues more broadly. And so sometimes human rights and social issues end up getting the short end of the stick. Um, and that's a problem. That is not what, what I think investors want, um, but I think sometimes unintentionally by um, sort of focusing on, on something that might just be uh, in the headlines or, or as a priority uh, at a particular moment in time, as opposed to taking a longer term approach to looking at how these things are integrated and, and can be addressed in a sort of more comprehensive way. Uh, it can end up sort of pulling uh, the responsible people and companies in different directions. So that's something for investors to be aware of. I think with the emerging um, sort of human rights and environmental due diligence, uh, mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence frameworks that we're seeing, obviously, uh, in Europe with the corporate uh, sustainability um, directive that's just been passed, that we're seeing similar moves in, uh, in Canada and elsewhere. Um, there's an opportunity, again, to, to sort of uh, identify how these things can be addressed in a more comprehensive way. Um, and so that's something to keep an eye on is, is kind of how those regulatory frameworks will end up having an impact on company decision-making behavior and transparency. Um, and then the last thing is just to say, uh, as I've kind of I hammered it out, I've hit it several times in the course of, of, of the day already, but I really do think that there's, there is more convergence happening now and more sort of blurring of the lines, as I've said, and that really calls for, for therefore more uh, of a sophisticated understanding by all actors, investors, regulators, policymakers, companies themselves, human rights organizations who to work with these companies and advocate around their behavior of the ecosystem and how certain risks um, uh, don't just apply to a particular company, but, but they may be exacerbated by what another company, either up or downstream from that particular company, may be doing and the decisions that they're making about how they design or how they make available their products and services. Um, we are uh, we have been having conversations around that for some time now um, and are working with Business for Social Responsibility to develop an ecosystem mapping tool that helps to illustrate this and make it easier for all the actors that I mentioned to understand the interrelationships between different actors in the ecosystem. We hope to build on that with some case studies. We've done one already on uh, the software as a service sector and we want to do uh, a number of other ones on particular sectors as well as particular geographies or particular risk challenges. Um, to help illustrate how, uh, you know, how these companies can do better working uh, collectively, collaboratively, not just with each other, but also with other stakeholders. Um, that can be, some of that can be done through GNI, but lots of that can also be done in other appropriate forms uh, and, and mechanisms. It sounds very exciting, uh, and I really look forward to, to learning more about that mapping tool. And um... I would like to thank you, to you all for, for all your inputs. It's been a, a wonderful panel discussion. And uh, I would like to also thank the RDR team um, and the New America team for, for helping with the setting up this event and for also preparing the whole publication. Um, you can find uh, our findings on our web page, uh, which I'm sure uh, you are all aware of. Um, we'll be coming out uh, with a few uh, more details uh, through various channels uh, in the future. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions about uh, the Taco Giant scorecard. And thanks again, Laura, Jason, Thomas. Have a great rest of your days and um, I hope to see you soon somewhere in the world. <laughs>